Hello, everybody. Uh, we are here today. I'm so glad to have everybody here. Uh, we have Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman with us today. Uh, Jeff is a former astronaut and current professor of aeronautics and, uh, and astronautics at MIT and an old family friend. He is a, uh, Deborah and I have known him since we were kids, and we are so proud to have him here with us today. Jeff took his first voyage to the stars in 1985 as a mission specialist on Discovery, the Space Shuttle Discovery, and has had four subsequent space flights, leaving the astronaut program in 1997. Jeff and his wife moved to Paris as NASA's European representative from until 2001 until he took his current position at MIT. Jeff, we are so glad to have you here. Why don't we get this party started? There you are. Jeff, you are muted, sir, just so you know. But let's do it again. There you uh, go. I, that's, I un unmuted myself before, but um, then it muted again all by itself. So <laughs> here we are. You, you can hear me okay, I guess. I can hear you great. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate yeah. it. Glad, glad Hi, Jeffrey. Go. It's Deborah. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Let's get Deb okay. in the room, Zoe. <laughs> there you are. Hi, Jeffrey. Yeah, I'd still recognize you both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a little harder with the beard. A little older, but little, hey, there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm a little older, too, than when you knew me, right? I uh, actually uh, had hair on all parts of my head, and most of it was still brown. <laughs> I, I blame it on the cosmic rays. Okay? The cosmic rays. <laughs> right, right, right. There you go. Well, welcome to our group. We are so excited to have you. Um, yeah, yeah. Dan is going to uh, take the lead here today. Um, but my mom is here, so I wanted you to say hi to mom. Yeah. Can you spotlight mom real quick? Dan? Oh, so I, handling I that. can. Give me a second to find her. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, Barbara, unfortunately, is out. She, um, I think first she had to go to the library to get some books because she reads about two books a day. Um, Always. And, and then she has to go and pick up our granddaughter. To, hey, Joe. Hi, Jeffrey. It's good to see um, you. And, and um, uh, you know, we've had various... Um, COVID things, we, we had to come back early from Oregon because our grandson, you know, Max, Sam's oldest, tested positive all of a sudden. Wow. And, and so they had to isolate and, 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 and I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But <laughs> let's not talk about that. Let's talk about some more fun things. How about? Yeah, let's talk about space. Well, we're excited and Dan, I am going to uh, turn everything over to you, um, but do we want to go ahead and unmute everyone, Dan, so that they can ask questions? Well, How we'll do that. We gonna do we're going to do that in the chat. Yeah. We'll do okay. that in the chat. Fantastic. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, perfect. awesome. Well, well good well, seeing you, you, Mom. I should mention, Dan, um, yeah, you, you did mention that I had four more flights after my first flight. Um, probably the, the flight that most people might have heard about was my fourth space flight in December of 1993. You may remember when the Hubble Space Telescope was put into orbit, it couldn't focus properly. Right. And, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the spacewalking crew that went out and fixed it. And, and so that was certainly my most memorable flight in, in the sense of having actually performed you know, a real accomplishment. Um, it, it was, um, and, and Hubble, you know, it's, people talk about the, the new Webb telescope. I, I'll take advantage of, of the time to talk about it, which, which sure. truly is revolutionary. But unfortunately, the media often turn, talks of it as the successor to Hubble, which it is not, because Hubble does things that Webb cannot do. Um, you know, there, there's this huge electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to microwaves to uh, infrared and visible light and ultraviolet and x-rays and gamma rays. Well, Hubble can see visible light, a little bit of infrared, but also into the ultraviolet. Right. Webb is an infrared telescope, and it's designed to be that way because 
the, what we really hope that we can do with the Webb telescope is to see far enough away that we can see the first stars and galaxies being born. Um, and although the light at that time might have been emitted in X-rays or ultraviolet because the universe is expanding, everything gets, all the wavelengths get longer and longer. And by the time they get to us, they're all in the infrared, heat, their heat radiation. And that's why the Webb telescope has to be kept so cold and is, it, we have to put it far away from the earth um, and, and never let the sun shine on it so that it's basically 40 degrees above absolute zero wow. because it's trying to detect heat. Mm -hmm. And if the telescope is hot, you'll, you know, you'll wipe out any heat, other heat that's coming in. So the telescope's gotta be really, really cold. And the detector that actually detects that heat can only be a tiny fraction of a degree above absolute zero. So it's a real engineering feat. A lot of new technology, which is one reason why it was delayed so much and why it costs so much more than when they originally started. But let's hope that it works as well as we hope it will, because it's not designed to be repaired. <laughs> so um it's too far out for us at the moment someday we'll be able to go out there and work on it but you know and maybe robots could do it as well but let's hope that it works well the first time incredible incredible it's, good. it's gotten out to where it's going to live a million miles away from the earth you know in the opposite direction from the sun and it'll sort of circle around that point until it runs out of fuel in five to ten years and hopefully we'll make some great discoveries between now and then. So stand by, lots of excitement on the way. Absolutely. I mean, you're involved in so many amazing things. Even currently right now, you're doing the work with Mars, uh, making oxygen on the planet right now, which is absolutely yeah. incredible. We, we call the experiment MOXIE. Some people might remember MOXIE as a soft drink and also as a expression in the English language. You Absolutely. Know, hey, you got, moxie, you got right? a lot of moxie. You... Right, right. Well, for us, it means Mars Oxygen ISRU Experiment. And the ISRU, it's sort of an acronym within an acronym, right? So ISRU is In Situ Resource Utilization, which is a fancy way of saying if we're gonna to go to Mars, it's really expensive to get stuff to Mars. And so any, anything that we can use that's already on Mars, we're way ahead of the game. And it turns out that we can actually produce oxygen on Mars without having to bring it from the earth because Mars has a little bit of an atmosphere. It's maybe a hundredth the, the thickness of our atmosphere, but it is there. And it's 95% carbon dioxide, CO2. That's two oxygen atoms in every carbon dioxide. And uh, what our experiment does is it, it pulls in that carbon dioxide and then it's, it puts it into an electrolysis. Now, what, what is that? I hope most people in the audience have had a high school chemistry course. And if you did, you electrolyzed water. You know, you put two electrodes in a beaker of water and you hook it up to a battery and sure enough hydrogen comes out one end and oxygen comes out the other end because water is H2O and, and if you put electricity into it in the right way you can separate it. It turns out you can do the same thing with carbon dioxide and so what we do is we split the carbon dioxide into a carbon monoxide molecule and an oxygen uh, um, molecule uh, we need to do two of them but yeah we end up with with oxygen pure oxygen and we don't have to bring it from the earth and the thing about oxygen uh you know why why it's so critical i mean obviously you need oxygen to breathe okay if i went to mars sure. i should be so lucky I, I i i used to hope that maybe you know we would actually get to mars while i was still an astronaut but that was Never to happen. I, I can't complain. I had five great space flights. Right. And you've, you've, you've done some things. Someday, someday yeah. people are going to go to Mars. And, and when they do, they're going to want to have oxygen to breathe, obviously. But assuming that they want to come home, they are going to need a rocket. I, I hope 
most of the people in the listening in and you know here saw the movie the martian you know with with matt damon and he gets stranded on mars and he eventually makes his way to a rocket which has been placed for another crew who has yet to arrive and it's fully fueled and that gets him off the surface of mars and gets him his ride home and that's exactly what the astronauts will use it for but the thing is to get six people up off the surface of Mars using that kind of a rocket, that, that rocket itself has a mass of about 50 tons. Obviously, it weighs less on, Earth, on Mars, but a mass of 50 tons equivalent on Earth, of which about 80%, like four ton, 40 tons, are just the rocket propellant. You know, rockets burn fuel and oxygen. Um, the space shuttle burned hydrogen and oxygen. We think on Mars will probably burn methane and oxygen. But the point is, of that 40 tons of rocket propellant, 78%, so, you know, more than three quarters, so like 31 tons is oxygen. So you need 31 tons and a little bit of extra just for safety, just to get off the surface of Mars and catch your ride home. That's a lot more than you're ever going to breathe. And, and so that's why, and, and here's the thing, to get one ton of anything onto the surface of Mars, you need to, and assuming that you're launching it off the surface of the Earth, you got to put a lot of stuff into orbit around the Earth because, you know, you, you, you want to get one ton to the surface of Mars. So, once you get to Earth orbit, and of course that in and of itself is pretty expensive, but once you're there, so you need a whole bunch of propellant to get the whole thing to Mars. You need a whole entry, descent, and landing system, you know, with the heat shields and the parachutes and the sure. rocket engines, and, uh, and, 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 and then you need the structure itself, and you need the rocket engines. Basically, to, to land one ton on the surface of Mars, you would need to put about 11 to 13 tons of material into orbit around the Earth. And um, so we're talking, what, you know, 30 tons of oxygen on the surface of Mars to get you off the surface. So, you know, you're looking at on the order of 500 tons that you have to put into Earth orbit. To give you an, uh, what that means, I mean, the, the Saturn V could put about 125 tons into Earth orbit. So four Saturn V rockets, and those were expensive. Wow. You know, Elon Musk, you know, with SpaceX, they're working on this um, Starship, which is going to be a lot less expensive to get things to Earth orbit. But nevertheless, you know, most of the stuff we're going to use on Mars we have to, to anything that's manufactured, you know, computers, spacesuits, habitats. I mean, we, we can't make those things on Mars, at least not, not at the moment. Um, and so those we have to take with them and you, just, uh, and you just have to pay the cost of getting there. But dumb old oxygen. I mean, to, to launch four Saturn V class rockets just to provide enough oxygen for the crew to get off the surface of Mars after they get there, is crazy if you can make that oxygen on Mars. And that's what our experiment is demonstrating. And we've, we've run it eight times now. Now it's, it's a tiny, you know, hundredths of the size of the, what the scale you would need for a real human mission. But it's the first time ever actually in history that uh, we have done this, what we call in ISRU, that we're really living off the land. Now, People have been using solar power, of course, which you could consider a local resource. But if, other than solar power, this is the, really the first time we've used indigenous material on the surface of another planet and, and made something out of it. And, and it's, a, it's a demonstration to show that the process works on Mars. We've been doing it for decades in the laboratories here on Earth. but. If you're going to count on something like making oxygen as a critical process, and I think I would consider, <laughs> consider that critical, you need to demonstrate that it works not just in the laboratory here on Earth, but in the actual environment where it's going to be used, which means you got to do it on Mars, which is what we're doing. And in doing this, we're also learning a lot about how are you going to someday make a much bigger version of this that really could support a human mission. So that's the other purpose of the experiment.
so it's really fun. Okay, I got to be honest with you. That's way above my pay grade there, Jeff. Oh, I got to be honest. I, I, I said that so you should be able to understand it. Fair enough. I'll Can tell I you what. Can I just say something? Hold on. Let me just say something to everybody out there. So I've known Jeffrey. Well, we've known Jeffrey since we were children. And when my, um, it, I was getting ready to learn how to drive a car. And my parents said, you need to learn how to drive a stick shift. Oh, but there was no way that I was going to learn how to drive a car with my father. So Jeffrey volunteered to teach me. Well, you just because you know, all our cars were are always stick shifts. Yes, that yes. You know, I don't know. I don't know any of our friends, other friends that you no, knew. You were the only one. Car. You were the only. So you just heard how Jeffrey explained that. Well, uh, we got into the car to um, to have. Um, our lesson and for the first hour and a half he had to teach me how a stick shift works uh unlike a regular um automatic car before he would even let me turn the car on so um he is very very detail oriented and that was my story that i wanted that's, to that's share with a, you guys that's why i'm a professor <laughs> that's go. right that's right oh my gosh you're amazing go ahead dan I'm sorry. yeah no no i'm gonna i'm gonna shoot back to the beginning of real quick though i'm when it all started for you all right jeff and i know we talked about some of this in the article but i i know everybody's going to appreciate hearing this for sure too well, um i i at my age i was i was a little kid in the 50s before sputnik was ever launched but it was the the dawning of the space age and and you know anyone who remembers it there were i mean the walt disney world on television had tomorrowland trips to the moon uh Werner von braun and willie lay were on television and in magazines and pictures of collier's magazine of how we're going to explore mars and and you know it was really exciting i mean this was the future and then we actually started doing it you know they, we launched sputnik um and you know nowadays if if you ever do look up at the sky almost any night you're going to see a, a couple of satellites go over it's nothing but but the shock of that first one was uh and and it it had a great impact on american education which i wish had lasted because there was a big push uh not just in words but supported by real money for you know science math the national science foundation which is what ultimately sent me to graduate school uh, by that time of course uh, people were flying in space we had astronauts and and you know like so many kids i i thought hey that'd be really cool because all of my heroes back in the 50s when i when i was a little kid they were all astronauts you know buck rogers tom corbett space cadet uh Flash Gordon, you know. Flash right? Gordon. Cool I got stuff. all, I got all those, I got all those serials on DVD right over there. They're fantastic. Well, I have the whole Flash Gordons on DVD. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I could talk to you about that for an hour. I mean, but, it's very dated yeah. now. But although, what's amazing, you you look now uh, at uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin. You know, they're landing these rocket ships. That's what they did in Flash. Right. Gordon. Right. And you, knew that you couldn't do it. I mean, because given, I mean, the, the computing power that you need, the speed to do the control system, because what you're doing when you're landing a rocket, I mean, try balancing a pen on your finger. You know, I, I can't do it. Maybe somebody can, but sure. uh, the, you know, even the computers that we had in the time of the shuttle, the space qualified computers, were, would be totally un, incapable of doing that. So it's amazing, though, that that now you know reality has has imitated art, and, and we're landing rocket ships just like Flash Gordon used to. And so, and this uh, this is all happening, and you're watching Sputnik fly over from a football field with your dad, right? And um, of course, I was also very interested in astronomy. Sure, I used to go to the planetarium, and I could identify all the constellations. And you know, that was one of my jobs in the Boy Scouts was to teach the kids the constellations because you had to do that for merit badge and so on, and and to find north and all that that good stuff. 
And, you know, I, I was good in school. I was good in mathematics and science and in, I mean, in all subjects, but I, I, I like science and math. Um, it became apparent, you know, I, I followed this all the space flights because, you know, they were really exciting and we were doing things for the first time. Uh, it, it had become apparent early on that all these astronauts were military pilots. And so, you know, dream about going into space. Yeah, that's great. But uh, I never considered it as a realistic career prospect because I was not going to be a military pilot. Uh, but I was interested in astronomy, and and like I say, the uh, and I had a nice uh, graduate fellowship from National Science Foundation, and did a doctorate in astrophysics, and went on. That was going to be my career. I I then um, did a uh, had a postdoctoral fellowship from Harvard that sent me over to England, where I was only going to stay for a year, working in an X-ray lab there. But I met a very nice English woman who you know very well. You know very well. Barbara. In fact, she may be here. Hold on. All right, we're going to stretch for just a minute, guys, while we're doing that. All right, we'll just stretch a little bit. It would be so cool to see Barbara. I haven't seen her in so long. Don't put me on spotlight, babe, please. Aww. We have to have a family reunion, everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> give us just one second. So the, um, but, you know, um, oh, Kathy sent me a note uh, while, we were, while we're waiting. She said, Flash Gordon was written by my best friend's uncle. We, she has we some, have oh. some visitors and I'm going to move to a different room. Okay. Because oh, fantastic. other people want to see you. Dan, you need to put your mom oh. on. Hey, Barbara. <laughs> oh, look at that baby. Hello there. Jory. Jory. Oh, hello, <laughs> Thank darling. You. Hi. Oh, aren't you good beautiful? To see you. Oh, it's good, good to see you. Good to see you, Barbara. Barbara, I found, I was looking for some of uh, Jeffrey's uh, landing uh, pictures. Oh, yeah. I, I found every card you've ever sent me ever in my entire life. Oh my oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, celebration people. Let me tell you my entire life, this lovely woman sent me cards with half naked men posing uh, hunky guys uh, whenever I was at summer camp. Not really half naked, not, I'm not serious about that, but she was, uh, she was the most fun person ever for a teenage girl. That is for sure. And I, <laughs> oh God, I, I remember you and your hairstyles. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Zoe, if you can hear me, I used to have shaved hair here, although not like Lisa. Lisa had a, a little more <laughs> crazy than I did. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, your baby is beautiful. Thank you. I just picked is this up orange? This is, is this orange? orange? Or yeah, Orange's daughter. Yeah. Oh and my she's goodness! Two years old, right? She's beautiful. Oh my goodness! She's not going to say anything because she. Uh, of course yeah. not. Of course not. Well, it's good to see oh. you, Barbara. It's lovely to see you guys. I know. Mwah! Good to see you. I'm going to cry. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to use that as a segue. Okay, I'm going to use that. that as a segue, real quick, Jeff. So, um, you know, you went to University of Leicester in England, and you met Barbara there. Okay, yeah. and, and then you came back to you. Know, how long you were only supposed to be there for a short time, and then you came yeah, back. But I, 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 I went over as a carefree young bachelor and came back three and a half years later with a wife and a ten-week-old son, actually, Sam. I know Sam. <laughs> Got into plenty of trouble with Sam as a kid. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're you you get back um, to you get back to MIT. Oh, oh, oh go yeah, ahead. No, I I um I joined the uh, X-ray astronomy group in the physics department at MIT. Mm -hmm. Um and that was in 1975. And it was around 1976 that NASA started doing the drop tests with the space shuttle, uh, the Enterprise. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had followed the space program, so I knew that the, the space shuttle was on its way. You know, nobody knew exactly what that meant in terms of astronauts or whatever, but 
uh, NASA announced that you know the shuttle could have a crew of seven, but they only needed two pilots, like in an airplane. And so that really changed the opportunities for scientists and engineers, medical doctors, uh, because you know we didn't have to be pilots. And so when NASA put out a call for astronauts for the space shuttle and they said, hey, scientists are encouraged to apply as are engineers and doctors. Um, sure, I put in my application, why not? I remember um, Barbara kind of laughed when I said, I'm gonna apply to be an astronaut. Uh, didn't, didn't take it seriously at first, <laughs> um, but um, and then, of course, nothing happens for a long time. And then uh, friends start calling up, hey, Jeff, there's a guy from the government been asking all these questions about you. So, you know, that's a good sign because it means you, you've gotten to the next step. And then I guess it was October of 77, I got a call saying, you know, on Wednesday saying, we'd like you to come down on Sunday, spend a week uh, at Johnson Space Center. You're in the finals. Wow. So. All right. Re rewind back though for a second. You got a phone call that said you needed to go and get your fingerprints taken. All right. You got to tell that, that story. That on the way. Well, that, that's when Barbara, I think, first realized that I was serious because, you know, that was before the days of electronic fingerprints and everything. Sure. And, and so I got a letter from NASA saying, you know, they're doing a background investigation on me, but they don't have any fingerprints. So I needed to go down to the police department have my fingerprints taken. And uh, so I told Barbara, yeah, I got to go to the police department. Whoa, what did, what did you do? And I don't know, just my, remember I applied to be an astronaut. I, they need my fingerprints. Oh, and she said, I've never seen anyone be fingerprinted. I'll come to. So, you know, I went down there and, you know, as I was, I was going, you know, one finger after the other and Barbara's eyes are getting bigger and bigger. And she finally said, you're really serious about this, aren't you? And, and um, of course, it was a bit late at that point. <laughs> um, because as I say, uh, not too much later than the friends start calling because it means I'd gotten to the next step and then get called down for an interview. And they told us we would hear the final selection. There were 200 finalists out of, I think, 8,000 applicants. They, they get more applicants these days because you can apply online. It was, a, it was much harder to do the application back then, but they still got 8,000 and uh, they ended up taking 35 of us, uh, but there were 200 finalists. And actually the week that I went down, they, as much as possible, they took astronomers. And in fact, in our class of 35, I'm ju jumping ahead a little bit, but, but we had, um, Four of, of the 35 selected, 15 were pilots and 20 were mission specialists, quite a few of whom were actually military as well. They were radar systems operators in airplanes who, who were not pilots. But, but there, were, there were a good number of scientists of whom four of us were astronomers and, and three, we were there together that week. It was George Nelson, Sally Ride and me and, and Steve Hawley, who was the other astronaut who got selected, was down in Chile at the observatory, so he couldn't make it that week. They got him later, but, um, but yeah, um, the, it was a great week when you, when you go down there because, yeah, you, you meet all the real astronauts, and even, even if you don't get selected, it, for anyone who's interested in, in space flight, you know, you, you get to go in the simulators and, and of course you, you get parts of your body looked at that you didn't even know you had <laughs> very extensive medical tests. And, um, and of course the most important thing is the interview and, um, and then you go home, uh, you have a big party that night and, uh, and then you go home and you wait. And they said we would hear by the end of the year, which came and went, nothing happened. And um, I guess it was in January because MIT always has, has a January break. And, and the, I guess um, the, school, the college was, was on break. Yeah, that was for, for David, my youngest brother, who I guess was still a, yeah. 
um, he was in college still at the time. So um, we all went skiing at Sun Valley, which my parents had a soft spot for because they went there on their honeymoon. And uh, on Friday, the phone rang in our condominium and it was NASA. And they, they said, are, are you gonna be at this number on Monday? Uh, yeah. They said, well, um, be sure that you're near the phone because you'll be getting a call from the astronaut selection board. And so, you know, <laughs> it was a suspenseful weekend, but uh, Monday, sure enough, the call came and it was George Abbey, who was head of flight crew operations, who asked me if I still wanted to be an astronaut. I think that's kind of the standard way they open those conversations. Sure. <laughs> and the, the answer came very quickly, yes. And he said, well, uh, we'd like you to come down and, and work with us. And, um, and so my father popped a bottle of champagne out of the refrigerator. He had, he, he had put it there, he hadn't told me just in case I didn't get selected, you know, we weren't going to open the champagne at the time. So, but we celebrated. So yeah, we didn't, we didn't go skiing until a little later that day, but uh, I was definitely feeling light on my skis. I was very happy. Yeah. I was going to say, how high did you jump up in the air when you got that news? When you get off the phone? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, well, like I say, it was, um, it was like skiing in powder, even though it was packed snow. That's sort of, you know, I was really, I was definitely hepped up. And you, you made the move to Houston from Boston. That must have been a culture shock like no other when you became now, part the of the 35 thing, new the guys. The thing was, um, you know, Barbara grew up in London um, and moved to Boston. And, you know, for Americans, Boston is a very old style European type city. And so when people would hear Barbara's accent, uh, oh, you're from England. Why, wow, you must feel so much at home here in Boston. And, but of course, for Barbara, everything was new. It was all different. It was American. And, 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 you know, what are they talking about? That was for three years. And then we moved down to Houston, which, of course, is a quintessential American city, you know, built around cars and, and no narrow streets to wander through and stuff. And, and after a year or two there, then, then she would sort of wistfully look up to the Northeast and say, oh, now I know what they were talking about, because the, the difference between Boston and Houston is probably greater than Boston to London. I don't know, but, you know, it, it was nice to have Boston as a transition, I think. Sure, that would have been, that would have been a lot, I mean, yeah. to, to take in for her. Uh, so you're part of the 35 new guys, the TFNG. And uh, so you're part of that and you, you go through your training you've, and you, you get your first assignment, but you're, there's a series of scrub missions, shuttle changes, things like that. What was that we, situation we were, like? It was first assigned, well, our crew was put together and we, we were, let's see, it must have been late in 83. I'd, I'd have to go back and look when we actually, it was announced because we were supposed to fly in June of 84. But um the way that you know the shuttles flights kept getting canceled and swapped around and payloads would get changed around and crews would get, get swapped and and normally if your flight got canceled you'd move to the next flight unless it was a flight which required really specialized training in which case like a space lab flight or in some cases in the early days at least a spacewalking flight um but in, in any case, um, sure enough, the crew before us, their flight got canceled. So they moved to our flight and we got bumped to a very interesting flight in, in August of 84, where we were going to actually use the robotic arm and we were going to pick up a little satellite and release it, fly away from it. Then a couple of days later, come back and pick it up. And, and so we had to get trained on how to use the robotic arm and how to do rendezvous and and you know it was it was it, it was a neat mission but the crew that took our june flight when they lit the engines of the shuttle there was a problem and they had a pad the fir very first pad shut down um and that's when steve hawley who was sitting in he was the flight engineer he, he said you know somehow the main engine cut off i thought we were going to be a little higher that, that went down as a famous phrase because, you know, main engine cutoff is when you're in space. Right. So, so anyway, 
um, they then decided in order to preserve the schedule, they would combine the June and the August flight. And so we, we got bumped because the next few flights after that were specialized flights, which the crew was already well in training for. And so we got bumped all the way to January of 85. And uh, yeah, finally, and this was a different, a different payload entirely. In fact, we were gonna launch the, 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 the uh, communication satellite that the original crew in March of 84 that got bumped to our June flight, that's what they were supposed to launch, but it wasn't ready. They had had problems that when they launched the very first one, um, the, the motor that was taking it from the shuttle up to stationary orbit uh, didn't work right. And so they couldn't launch another one until they fixed the rocket motor. And it, in March, it wasn't, wasn't ready, but they said by January of 85, it would be, and that's the flight we got. So we trained for that. Um, on every flight, uh, two people in the crew are trained how to use space suits just in case there's an emergency or something. Uh, none of our flights um, were planning to do spacewalks. But on the other hand, every different payload, there are certain things that if latches don't open or something, then you can actually go out and do something manually and, and save the day. And so we train for that. So we actually... We, I, you know, I spent a lot of time training to do EVA, uh, and because we were assigned to four different flights, um, I, I have actually more time than, than the average first time astronaut who had never done, who wasn't planning to do a, a planned EVA. Mm -hmm. but anyway, um, we got right down to January and getting ready for the launch. We went into medical quarantine and uh, we had lunch and then they said, oh, the flight's been postponed a, a little while, go home. Um, all right, a week or so later, yeah, ready to go, come back, went into quarantine, had lunch in the evening, no, no, go home, um, another postponement. And, you know, we weren't getting really the word. Of, we, we thought that the rocket was ready to go um, and we didn't know why, but, you know, we, the third time, <laughs> Barbara said, no, you're, you're not going anywhere. Leave your suitcase here. You know, if you have to stay overnight, give me a call. I'll bring the suitcase. Um, and after lunch, they said, no, the flight's been canceled. There's <laughs> apparently, yeah, the rocket engine was fixed, but there was now a problem that surfaced with the satellite itself, which was not ready to go. And so they canceled that flight and put us on a flight which eventually went, it was supposed to go in March of 85, but, it, but there were other problems and we never went till, until March of, um, uh, until April of 85. And, and our job was basically to launch two satellites. So, you know, we, we were originally on a four day flight. It was gonna have two day, uh, launch the first satellite, the, um, the first day, the second satellite, the second day. Do a couple of medical experiments uh, for a day, uh, then, get things ready to come home and, and come home. Um, so we wouldn't really get to use it. But there happened to be a robotic arm on the shuttle at the time, and they decided it was easier not to take it off. So they, they left it there, which turned out to be very, very uh, important because um, what happened was we finally did launch actually, um, you know, 10 months after we had originally hoped to go for the first time, but, you know, by the time you're on the launch pad, you're sort of not, not you know, never mind what, what came before and what right. didn't happen. Because when they light those engines, you get the big kick in your pants and everything starts shaking, and, you know, you're on your way and no more delays. Uh, you know, this is it. So, and it's pretty exciting. I mean, it's quite a ride riding on top of the rocket. Pretty exciting. I would have to imagine that would be absolutely incredible. I mean, the yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like something you've never experienced before. It's, oh yeah. Um, when the solid, it, the, the the vibrations actually from from the shuttle come from the solid rockets. The um, once the ro once they fall off after two minutes, it's actually a very smooth ride, burning hydrogen and oxygen in the main engines. 
Um, I don't know what a methane oxygen rocket will be like, and I don't know what, you know, every rocket is, is different, I guess. Uh, people have ridden the Soyuz, have ridden the Saturns, and also the shuttle. And, uh, you know, the first part of the shuttle is very violent, but then it's very smooth. And of course, coming back from space in the shuttle is very easy because you have wings. And so you have lots of lift. And so you never pull more than about one and a half Gs. Whereas when you come back in a capsule, you know, you're pulling five or six Gs. And, and um, that's not, you know, you can do it, but it's not much fun. I've seen the right stuff. It doesn't look comfortable. I'll just put it like that. So the, um, okay. So you're, it's 85. You're about to get, you're, you're, you're ready to launch. Okay. I'm there. My mom's oh, there. My launch. That's what we've been talking about. Yeah, no. Now the thing is now we're up in space. And, and so after going through that incredible experience of launch, all of a sudden the engines stop and and now I, I feel I'm just floating up in my seatbelt and, and I release the seatbelt. And the thing is, you know, we, we do this a lot in the NASA's zero gravity plane, but after about 20, 25 seconds, you have to get back in your seat or sit down on the floor because you're going to pull out at two G's. And, and I found myself, I was floating in the seat, but I was waiting for the pullout. And, and that's when it sort of hit me. No, no, no pull out. We're in orbit. And yeah, I fl floated over to the window and, and there was the coast of Africa coming over the horizon. And, and um, man, I couldn't stop smiling for, well, probably, <laughs> probably the whole time I was up there. Um, but, you know, it, you, it's very busy when you first get into orbit. And a lot of times people aren't feeling very good because of space sickness and so on. Uh, but but that's why we practice the first day in space over and over and over. So because you have to really you reconfigure the whole shuttle from being a, a you know a rocket into being an orbiting spacecraft. So you have to put away the seats and change your clothes and a whole bunch of stuff. We did that, and and in addition, Ray, Ray Seddon and I were responsible for launching the satellite. So we launched the first satellite. It was a Canadian telecommunications satellite. Went fine. Uh, we went to bed, I mean, had dinner, went to bed, got up the next morning, launched the second satellite, which was a U.S. Navy telecommunications satellite. And, you know, we had done this dozens of times in the simulator. And after about two minutes, there's a little antenna on the satellite, which pops up. And, th and that receives now commands from the ground and, and gets everything else going. And it also tells you that the satellite is alive. And we launched the satellite and, and what, what we're supposed to do at that point, because 45 minutes later, the engine on that satellite is going to ignite and take it up into geostationary orbit, which is where communication with satellites you know, normally go. Um, but I, you know, after a few minutes, I, I noticed I didn't see any antenna pop up. And I, I mentioned that to Ray and, and yeah, it was supposed to pop up. So I called down to the ground and, you know, it could be a faulty antenna or it could mean that the satellite somehow was, was, had not turned on. We, we didn't want to take the chance that it was a faulty antenna popping up and that the satellite was going to fire its engine 45 minutes later. So they told us, uh, you know, do what we would normally do to move away from it, but then do the reverse firing. So that instead of just moving further and further away, because if the satellite was really dead, then they wanted the opportunity to study it with the possibility that we might go back and get it. And here's where it got really interesting because we had no rendezvous checklist on our on the, on the shuttle because we, we weren't planning to do a rendezvous. And we had not done any rendezvous training since June of 1984 when, when we got bumped from the August flight. But apparently we got good grades from our training instructors and they said, yeah, if, if, but, but they don't have a checklist. 
Back in those days, the only way they could send up printed material to the shuttle was an old teletype machine, you know, all capital letters on, on cheap yellow paper. So they basically, they got somebody to transcribe the entire checklist onto the teleprinter and they sent it up to us. And there was about 30 feet of teleprinter roll. And then we had to cut it up into individual pages and paste it into one of our old checklists that we had already used that we didn't need anymore to make our own one. I mean, it was just, it was, and in the, in the meantime, they came up with the idea that um, there is a little switch on the outside of the satellite, which normally when it's in the shuttle is held closed for safety reasons. You don't want the engines to fire when, when it's in the shuttle, that would be a bad day. But as soon as it comes out of the shuttle, the switch opens up. So, and there's a little micro switch under that. So maybe the switch got stuck or something like that. So um, we could actually do something about that. I mean, we didn't have any special equipment to capture the satellite and open it up or whatever, but, um, but we did have access to the switch. So the, the first, I, uh, the, the idea was um, we, we would make um, these little tools and then they, had to be attached to the end of the robotics arm and it as it happened we were trained to use the arm um, but they would have to be attached by some going out and doing a spacewalk this is the fly swatter the fly swatter okay so they first yeah they called up and they i always remember they said you know we're thinking of several uh, several options here um, one of which might involve an eva spacewalk mm -hmm. Ears pop up. What? What did they just say? Uh, no, they'll never let us do that. I mean, you know, th this is this is a EVA that has never been planned or practiced. Uh, NASA's never done anything like that before. But sure enough, that's what they decided to do. And <laughs> so we suited up and we did it. And boy, was it incredible. Okay, so now I got to ask you about that. Yeah, because you're you are, this is unplanned you're suiting up you're in the airlock the door opens what were you thinking at that moment in time you're in space you're in a void you, there's no ground underneath you you are moving at how fast at, at how many miles an hour that's going to be incredible 18,000 18, miles an hour about five miles a second but you know it doesn't feel like you're moving right because there's no vibration there's no wind noise there's no you know trees or billboards going by the window um the the only way you know you're going fast is you fly over california and then 10 minutes later you fly over new york and and so you know intellectually you're going fast but and you know by the laws of physics just because i go outside i'm not going to get blown away like if you left an airplane that's flying in the atmosphere uh, you know, I know my physics, so I, I don't worry for me. Uh, and, and remember, I had, I had done this many times in the water. So, and, and the first thing I had to do, I went out first and, and I had to go over, sort of float over on my stomach to the uh, tool chest and, and get the tools we would need to, to do the job. And as long as I was doing that, I was looking down into the shuttle at the floor of the, of the cargo bay. And I put them on and I remember thinking to myself, boy, this, this is just like being in the water. I mean, this is great. That was really good training, which it was. It was the best closest we can get. Then I turned around to get back and there was the earth and the sky. And, oh my God. You know, it's like in, uh, hey, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was, it was really extraordinary. Um, we got to the job um, and, and we did it. And, and actually um, I got good mark. They, they, they evaluate you when you do things like this, obviously. I mean, this was uh, one of the, th they, they check with the trainers, you know, how, how did they do in their EBA? Can we trust them to go outside? And because they weren't really planning to do it, but they really prepare you well. I mean, even though I wasn't planning to do a spacewalk, Part of the training is shortly before they send the spacesuits to Florida to be packed, I get in my spacesuit, I go into a vacuum chamber, they pump me down and, and you know, I'm actually 
in a space environment and it gives you confidence in your suit so you know and and we get training on a lot of suit malfunctions you know what happened what do you do if this happens and so on so um it's not the sort of thing i worry about i mean i if something happens that that i can do something about uh, i'm well trained i'll do the right thing and if a meteor happens to come on <laughs> along with my number on it i mean there's nothing i can do about it so why worry okay so you're in this situation that is much bigger than you okay like this is this is huge let's take it down to the mundane for a second so you're in space you have to eat you have to not wash a, not while you're in the space suit no not while you're in the space suit of course no but okay. in the shuttle what about those moments what about those times i mean how difficult is it to take care of the usual things that you would do in your normal day like that well, i mean you know the food is it's kind of the kind of food you take on a camping trip mostly dehydrated in the early days of the shuttle later on they started using mres you know that the military mm -hmm. developed um yeah have hot water available um and so you just rehydrate your food and um you know what the, the only the thing that i really um craved when i got back was a, a good salad you know something that you because we don't have a refrigerator right or a freezer so uh you know you can bring fresh fruit for a, for a few days and uh, i always brought my bananas of course um but but they don't last that long um so you don't go into space if you're interested in a michelin three-star experience you, right. on the other hand the view is definitely three star four star four star okay so and you took i you took you know you you've worked you did this fly swatter you we talked about hubble um you took personal items with you and I'm really excited to talk to you about that. You know, uh, everybody in the room, uh, you know, Jeff was the first uh, Jewish American male on in space. And that is very significant. And you were approached by, you know, Rabbi Stiebel, then Rabbi Osachi, uh, from Clear, Rabbi Stiebel from Clear Lake, Texas, uh, Clear Lake, Houston, Texas, everyone. And then Rabbi Osachi from up in, up in the downtown Houston area. Uh, to bring uh, some personal, uh, you know, some Judaica, some personal items and that sort of thing with you on the ship or on the, sp on the space shuttle, not like a ship. This isn't the Enterprise and from Star Trek. Um, but tell me, I mean, so talk to me about that a little bit. Um, I know for a fact, oh, real quick, I know for a fact that you brought something special for me up in space. And uh, if Deborah's in the room, she actually has that with her. Um, so can you spotlight me, sweetie? Yeah, and show that. And then, Jeff, can you talk about this for us a little bit? So that, that's a mezuzah. So I, um, yeah, uh, Rabbi Stiebel asked when I was training for my first flight when we were living down in Clear Lake um, if, if I would have an interest in taking any Jewish ceremonial objects. I mean, I'm, I'm Jewish and that's my heritage. Uh, and, and I thought, yeah, that would, that would be a, a good thing to do. And so he put me in touch with various Jewish artists. And uh, I, I took quite a number of mezuzahs. Actually, on all of my flights, I, I would take at least several mezuzahs. Um, and many of which uh, I gave to, to friends and, uh, you know, like you. And, and mm -hmm. it's on the door of the uh, Science Museum in Jerusalem. Um, and so, then, oh, go ahead. And, and you know, I, I took the atarot for the, uh, the talisim of Sam and Oren, mm -hmm. uh, which we, we couldn't take the, all the talis because they were, they were too big. You're limited in the size and, and weight of, of what you're allowed to take as personal objects. But yeah, I, I, you know, the Jewish tradition is a very old one. And somehow the juxtaposition between, you know, one of the old tradition, older oldest traditions of, of humanity and 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 space which is the future for me um uh, that was that always fascinated me you know the, these the two cultures it's so old but still enduring and and going into space and you know Ju also judaism has always been a a mobile religion you know you travel uh, all over and 
uh, take objects with, with you. And, and um, so this is, that was sort of symbolic as well. And uh, yeah, it kind of culminated on my last flight where I, I finally, uh, what Rabbi Osachi was able to find a Torah, which was small enough to qualify to fly as one of my personal objects. And uh, I actually uh, was able to read and perform a ceremony, uh, which has now been made into a movie now about the space Torah. And uh, I hope if people haven't seen it and are interested, they, they can go on, uh, you know, space, space Torah project.com, I think, and there's all, all sorts of information about it. But, uh, but yeah, and, and I, I, I started to, re you know, it, I think one of the Jewish newspapers in Houston picked up that I was um, taking these objects or I had taken them uh, after the flight and, and that somehow got carried around Jewish press around the country. And I started getting letters from people saying that it was very meaningful to them that, that these uh, objects had, had uh, you know, going into space, and uh, you know, and I realized that that this was symbolic, not just for me, but it had meaning to other people. So I was happy to share the experiences, uh, you know, of, of what I did. I guess the the most public was uh, during the the mission to repair the, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was December of '93, happened to occur during Hanukkah, uh, and and I I had been given. The previous summer, I was I was in Jerusalem, uh, and an artist gave me an absolutely magnificent, beautiful uh, uh, silver dreidel and and uh, menorah, Hanukkah, uh, portable folding up menorah, you know, the size of a cigarette box or even smaller. Um, but um, and I took those, and after we had finished all of our spacewalks and repair activities, we we had about a half a day of free time. To relax before we had to pack up and get ready to come home and so I took the dreidel out and I was spinning it and what I didn't realize was that the tv camera on the mid deck was on was live and and that picture was going down to the ground and the Capcom <coughs> Susan Helms called up to me hey Jeff um what's that that you're you're doing there I, I'll bet all America would would like to know what what you're doing um, and, and then I realized the camera was live and I hadn't planned to do anything public about this. I mean, it was my private thing, but I said, all right, they asked. So I gave, you know, I took the drill and I gave a spiel about Hanukkah and the Festival of Lights and it got picked up by a TV station in Los Angeles. And, and it, it, uh, I mean, it's now on the, uh, on YouTube, you just, you know, drills in space and so on. Uh, so that was certainly the most public of, of the <laughs> Jewish objects that I ever took. And how long did the dreidel spin for? Uh, until I had to stop it because, you know, ultimately you got to put things away because we had to pack up. And uh, But uh, ultimately, you know, if it's spinning in the air, the air friction ultimately would stop it. But if you were really spinning in a vacuum, it would pretty much spin forever. Wow. That's amazing. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't make it much of a game then because it never falls down. So you can't right, yeah. It. So there's gonna be a lot of disappointed children who don't get their uh, get their candies or their you know pennies or whatever you're playing for that night. Uh, yeah. Dan, do we have any questions for Jeffrey that we, we want to have him ask? Yeah, I was gonna wrap. I was gonna wrap up a couple more questions and then pass it over to Zoe for for questions and answer session. So. So if anybody would like to ask Jeffrey a question, please type it into the chat and uh, Zoe can get to you guys, okay? Um, okay, so we've, we've talked about um, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but I'm, I want to ask you a couple quick questions. I mean, you've lived an amazing life. I mean, you've, you've done sport parachuting, mountain climbing, you're an avid skier, you're an astronaut, a professor, you've been a diplomat for NASA in Europe. You're also a husband and a father. How has all of this impacted your family? What is, how is that? I mean, they got to be so proud. I'm sorry? And grandfather. And grandfather. And grandfather. That's true. Uh, how, uh, how is this, I mean, how has this shaped your family? I, I remember one, um, uh, Sam told me once, I don't remember how old Max was, but there was something about NASA and I was on television and, and, and Max asked Sam, 
Dad, is is Granddad famous? So you know, from a, a, but frankly, growing up in in Clear Lake, you know, my my friends had fathers who were astronauts too. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's not like I was a professional football player, uh, which would have been much more rare in in Clear Lake, at least. Um, so. Um, I think, you know, early on, of course, Barbara was always worried about the worst possible outcome uh, of a space flight because, you know, my second space flight would have been the very next flight after the Challenger disaster. And, and uh, you know, I, I was always willing to accept the risk because of, of what we were able to accomplish once we're in space. But, uh, you know, it's it's not an easy thing for the family to see one of your loved ones, you know, in a potentially dangerous situation. So, I mean, I I understand uh, Barbara was really frightened every time I launched. Sure. When the kids were young, it was all fun and games. I think by the time of my last flight, they also appreciated the gravity of what was going on. Uh, you know, they were they were older teenagers by the time by that time. Last question. If you have the opportunity to go back to space, whether it be Na with NASA, whether it be SpaceX, whatever the situation is, would you would you take that situ that opportunity again? Oh, in a minute. Don't tell Barbara. No, um, it's between I, you and I me and the, it's between you and me and the 90 people in the room right now. How's there that? We, there we go. No, I mean, uh, space is great. I'd, I'd love to. I, I still get an opportunity uh, and I'll be doing it again this this May with some MIT students to fly on the zero gravity plane. So still get a little bit of weightlessness now and again. And it's not quite the same, but it's it's still pretty good good fun. Uh, it's a great way to lose weight. <laughs> they don't call it the vomit comet for nothing, right? Well, um, luckily I was okay in space, uh, and and. Um, you know, they they actually fly these uh, zero G flights uh, commercially for people who are interested in the space experience. I mean, quite seriously, yeah. If, if you don't happen to have a quarter of a million dollars <coughs> to get three minutes of weightlessness uh, in one shot on Jeff Bezos or or Richard Branson's machines, you can try uh, the zero G flight, which is a few thousand dollars, but you'll get fifteen. Uh, sessions, 15 or six, 16 sessions of like, you know, 20 or 25 seconds. So, you know, take your pick. Uh, I, I don't work for them, by the way, but right. it, it's fun. it is fun. I took my brother Bob on, on one of those for his 60th birthday. And he said it was definitely worth waiting. He had always wanted me to take him on the NASA plane, which of course I couldn't do. Sure. Um, I took him on, on the zero G plane commercially for his 60th birthday. And he said it was definitely worth the wait. We had a great time. It's fantastic. Jeff, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I, this has been phenomenal. It's been great catching up with you and uh, great getting to see you. And uh, I'm going to pass this over to Zoe Frostar and she is going to go through questions and answers with you. Okay. Fantastic. Hello and there, Dr. Hoffman. How are you? Good. Hope you are too. I am doing well. First things first, I think I speak for everyone. Thank you so much again for joining us today. This is an amazing experience for all of us. Um, <clears throat> so thank you so much for that. I also wanted to um, make one quick mention of our sponsor, Holiday Retirement, um, for helping to make this program happen along with Dr. Hoffman. Um, so thank you, everyone. So I have a bunch of questions that um, our viewers have been putting into our chat message for you. And I apologize if some of them are repeats to some of the things you may have already said, but I want to make sure um, that our viewers, um, you know, have an opportunity to ask and, and specifically have their question answered. So, yeah, so, um, so the, the question is, when will we get the first photos from the Hubble? I don't think they mean from the Hubble. They okay. Webb Telescope. That's what it Web is. Webb Telescope is the new one. Okay. Well, yeah, and, and you're going to have to excuse my 
I, I, I still am a professor, so I, I have to explain that, you know, when Hubble was launched, it just had one big mirror. Right. Uh, unfortunately, that mirror was was out of focus. But if it had been in focus, they would have gotten pictures pretty quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Web telescope, because it's so much bigger, it can't be made out of one big mirror. So it's made out of 18 separate mirrors. Oh, wow. And each of those mirrors, you know, after it gets up into space, they're not all focusing at exactly the same point. So it's going to take a while for them to adjust all those mirrors. They said they, they don't know exactly. They put kind of the upper limit was six months. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if it turns out to be more difficult than they thought, but it may be before that. Believe me. Um, but the thing is, they, they're not going to release an image until they make the image as good as the telescope is capable of doing. And, right. and so it's worth waiting for. So just, you know, we, how many decades have we waited to get this thing up there? We, we, <laughs> we can wait uh, a, a few months until they've really got it up and, and working properly and can do its stuff. Wonderful. And, you know, it should be brilliant. It should be brilliant. It, it really is exciting stuff. Um, so our next question it comes from your conversation about Mars. And I had no clue that they were working on oxygenating the planet more. So does Mars spin? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say oxygenating the no? planet. No? We're, we're, we're producing oxygen so that people can use it as part of their mission. Um, it wouldn't gotcha. be to release that oxygen out into the, the atmosphere, it would just, you know, evaporate off into space. Okay, awesome. All right. So does well, Mars... Actually, I'll say, people sometimes ask me about, you know, does that mean you, this is the first step in terraforming Mars, you know, turning Mars into a habitable planet like the Earth? Mm -hmm. um, right now, we may be able to live inside you know, little domes of habitats, but the amount of energy it would take to really terraform Mars is so much greater than anything humanity now is capable of. I, oh, yeah. I don't, I don't want to talk about what people might be able to do a thousand years from now if we don't kill ourselves off, but uh, right now it's, it's out of the question. We just have to learn how to survive on Mars. Right, right. Does Mars spin like Earth? Oh, yeah. A day on Mars is almost the same as a day on Earth. It's a little bit, it's about 40 minutes longer. Um, mm -hmm. Mars also goes around the sun, but it takes two Earth years for Mars to go around the sun once. And because the Earth and Mars are going around at the same time, they actually get sort of, the Earth passes underneath Mars, between Mars and the sun, mm -hmm. roughly every 26 months. And that's why we can only launch things to Mars every 26 months, because wow. otherwise it's too far away and our current rockets can't get us there. Right, right. That kind of puts a damper on, uh, on progression if you have to wait 26 months. Um, you have to plan ahead. Yeah, definitely. Um, so someone made a comment. They saw a program on how much space junk there is. Do you know um, if we are studying ways to eliminate that? Um, you know, what are the chances it could fall to Earth and cause some sort of damage or disaster? Oh, I only wish it would fall to the Earth because it won't hit the Earth. It'll mostly burn up in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, but it can cause tremendous damage up in space. And this is a very serious problem. Um, everybody talks, it's like the weather, you know, everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. Um, it's an international global problem um, that we don't have a global solution for. Yeah, people are talking about ways of cleaning it up, but who's going to pay for it? Uh, there are legal problems, um, and um, I mean, I hope that it's not going to take a catastrophic event to finally force the world to deal with it, but, uh, you know, we've made progress in learning how to prevent more space junk from being uh, created by rockets blowing up 
you know, after they're up in orbit for a while. But now, you know, we're launching tens of thousands of, of these little communication satellites. And, uh, you know, I, I hope they're doing their calculations right. But, you know, it doesn't take too many collisions before you have, what, uh, you know, an exponential runaway. And it is conceivable that we could make low Earth orbit uninhabitable if we don't take care of it. Hmm. In which case, no space station and, and no, uh, you know, not very much space tourism either. Right, right. Um, so I have to, I have to draw attention to this. Someone made a comment of all the patches on your jacket. So what are they for? These are for every one of my missions. I have a patch. I had five space flights. So uh, my first, first space, no, here we go. My first space flight, um, sec, second, third, this is the Hubble mission and my final space flight. Yeah, and that you know we like to sew things on our on our jackets, and uh, and then I get a a mock you know, mock twenty six patch up here because we entered the atmosphere at twenty six times the speed of sound. That's awesome. Actually, most can you most pop ID real quick, Kenny? Sure. Yeah. Can you pop ID or what is, I want to show you something, Jeffrey. This I there have this go. patch of yours. This was your Challenger patch that you right. actually that never was, got to go on the, that flight. That was the January flight that got canceled mm -hmm. when they kept sending us home from quarantine. Yep. And then look so what I have here, we Jeffrey. We this is the invitation to the uh, to the shuttle launch. There I you still go. have that. Can you believe it? Yeah. I can. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. No, here, we had to send all, all our invitations. We had to send out again. <laughs> Here's a picture of you and your baby. Well, they're not babies anymore. They're daddies now. Uh, but that's your Sam and Oren when you landed. I believe that was after your first first flight. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, okay. Very cool. With so how old would that invitation be? I have to ask. Well, that fl those flights were 1985. Wow. So 30, 37 that was the year old. I year before I graduated from high school, believe it or not. Wow. Go. Well, Jeffrey, I just want to say thank you so much. And um, this was such an incredible thing. I, I wanted to have you in Celebration Magazine for so many years. And um, I was thrilled when you said yes. And so well, thank you for that. I mean, it, it, it sort of brought our families back in, in contact. I know. It's been great. Yeah, it's been I mean, great. I... I remember walking walking in after work one day and Barbara was on the phone, uh, you know, <laughs> rapping away, going over all our family history. And, you know, I, you know, who's that? Who's that? And she sort of, you know, tried to shush me up and then finally said, it's Joe Price. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, we, we reconnected. So oh, that's I great. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. And um uh, to my team, thank you, Zoe and Brittany and Rosa and Dan. Dan, you did such an amazing job today. Thank you so much and for that. Give our, give our love to Lisa as well. For sure, oh, we yeah. will. I'll text her as soon as we're done. Everyone, thank you so much for coming today. And um, thank you, Holiday, for uh, being our sponsor. We really appreciate it. There's Dan. Hello. And, uh, real quick behind me, I just wanted to show you, Jeffrey. I don't know if you remember this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I this gave is, that to your dad. You did. This is your flight plan for the XTS-1. It's your uh, flight plan. I'll actually that bring the, this up to- first, That was the, the flight track of the first flight of the shuttle with John Young and Bob Crippen. There you go. And we've got all of your signatures on here. I'm That's actually going to bring it up to the spot, everyone, <laughs> um, so that you guys can enjoy it up there when you come up uh, for events or what have you, and everybody can take a look at it. And I'll bring all of our memorabilia. So if you stop by, um, you know, please, please take a look at all of these these uh, wonderful memories that we have of uh, Jeffrey and his amazing career. So without further ado, thank you so much, everybody. Have a thank wonderful you. afternoon, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for your thank time. Thank you.